Welcome back. This segment is entitled Diagnostic Criteria Nasolabial Angle. Here is the nasolabial angle. In an ideal situation, it would be around 100 degrees, from, and the range of normal is considered from 90 to 110. The nose lip angle is almost always too obtuse in class two patients. Uh, traditional orthodontics with a headgear or removal of teeth and retraction makes the, the number, which is already too large, even larger. What this means is that orthodontic treatment to develop the upper and lower jaws forward is preferable to headgear wear and or removal of teeth if improved facial aesthetics is the goal, and certainly if we're wanting to optimize the airway for our patients, it is the goal. So let's look at a, a patient or two patients actually here. This is a mother and her daughter. The mother was missing an upper lateral incisor and had a peg lateral incisor. She underwent orthodontic treatment in which the peg lateral incisor was extracted and the space for that tooth was closed and the missing lateral incisor space was closed. She also had lower bicuspid teeth removed and was retracted back. So this results in a 140 degree nose lip angle, which is a very, very, very large number, makes her have very flat cheeks and a very empty look to her face. Her daughter had the exact same problem orthodontically with a peg lateral incisor and a missing lateral, but we opened space to put a veneer for the uh, peg lateral and for an implant for the missing lateral. We didn't take out any teeth in the mandible and we used orthotropics to develop the face forward, resulting in a 118 degree nose lip angle, which whereas it's not ideal, it's a whole lot better than her mother. And you can see the dramatic difference in the facial balance associated with this. <clears throat> so let's look at a typical class two case. Here's a young boy who has a class two division one malocclusion with a very large overjet. And you can see the progression of treatment here from the beginning to the, to the finish using orthotropics. But let's break this down a little bit and show it to you in pieces. He starts out with a 135 degree nose lip angle, which really says his maxilla is too far back. It needs to be moved forward. Now, this boy had a, a number of orthodontic opinions to have headgear and or have teeth extracted to retract his front teeth back. His mother thought better of that and had us do orthotropics. Here you can see what we do with orthotropics. We advance the upper incisors about eight to 10 millimeters and you can see the space between the permanent lateral and the primary cuspid in this case. We've created an even larger overjet. We then develop the mandible forward with an appliance which negates the headgear effect <clears throat> and you can see the nice forward development of the mandible which has occurred. You can also see the dramatically improved nose lip angle which is now 105 degrees which is in, considered inside the ideal range. Now you can see also that the mandible has come forward rather dramatically. His chin is much more prominent which is a wonderful thing both aesthetically and functionally you're going to see that in a moment. You then contrast that with a more traditional treatment of wearing a headgear. And here in this example, the, the child wearing the headgear has a 135 degree nose lip angle, just like our patient. And I put on a drinking straw here for that's what the kind of an airway that child is going to have, unfortunately. <clears throat> so here we see the patient that we treated. This is an old x-ray and I've lined in the airway where, so you can see it well, but you can see on the left, pre-treatment, the very large overjet, and on the right, there's no overjet remaining, but you can see the dramatic improvement in the airway achieved in this particular case with orthotropic treatment. <clears throat> Let's go back to the literature of 1981 and talk about class two malocclusion. Dr. James McNamara, one of the most famous orthodontists in the world from the University of Michigan did this study. And what he found was rather interesting. He found that only a small percentage of cases in the study exhibited maxillary skeletal protrusion relative to cranial and cranial-based structures. On the average, the maxilla was in a neutral position. It was more often in a retruded than protruded position. In reality, if you look at these patients today with the modern diagnostic criteria we are using, you'll find that virtually all class two patients have the maxilla too far back. He further stated the mandibular skeletal retrusion was the most common single characteristic of the class two sample. So obviously it would make sense to try to develop the mandible forward and retract everything. 
Finally, he stated that maxillary skeletal protrusion is not a common finding. In fact, more cases of maxillary retrusion were observed. Thus, it appears that in designing the ideal treatment regime, those approaches which might alter the amount and direction of mandibular growth could be more appropriate in many cases than those which restrict maxillary development. John Mew, of course, has recognized for many years, even prior to 1981, that the maxilla needs to be developed forward and then the mandible developed forward. And with the child you just saw, you can see the results both aesthetically and in terms of his uh, airway, how excellent the result can be if this is done. So there you have the uh, second diagnostic criteria, the nasolabial angle. It's very easy to see <laughs> and it accurately measures the position of the maxilla in the face.